Today, I'm with Dr. Allison Shrikande, the medical director at Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine. We discuss what pelvic floor rehabilitation is, how it can help with a variety of conditions, including urinary urgency or frequency, feelings of having a UTI, or pain and discomfort during and after intercourse. So first, what I'd love to do is introduce you to our audience and and have you share your background. Sure. So essentially, I am a physiatrist or otherwise known as a rehabilitation doctor. And essentially what that means is we treat the muscles, nerves, and joints of the pelvis non-operatively. And physiatrists typically take more of a holistic approach when um, treating in patients with chronic pelvic pain or pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. Maybe you could tell us also, based on your background, what inspired you to start this center? Essentially, I was a final year resident, and I was pregnant with my first daughter, Ava. And during pregnancy, I had significant sacroiliac joint dysfunction, some pubic symphysis issues, and then had a challenging vaginal delivery. And postpartum, I had really pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, and I had pain with intercourse, an ur- urinary urgency, frequency, um, a sensation of a UTI that would not go away. Uh, essentially, I went to my OBGYN first at the six-week checkup. Everything was fine. Then I went back again at uh, 10 weeks, same complaints, did an ultrasound, workup was still okay. Uh, I was offered painkillers, um, opioids or, and strong NSAIDs, really no other solution. <laughs> So then I I found this excellent pelvic floor physical therapist who examined me, explained to me what was going on and really helped get me better. And she was just fantastic. So then I really thought, wow, this is such a cool field and um, clearly, you know, undertreated, underdiagnosed. And I just really wanted to get into that field at that point. And it was perfect timing because I was was just graduating from residency and deciding within the world of rehab, what, what area to specialize in. So that's how, I, that's how it started. It started pretty organically, slowly. Started off at Cornell and then, then joined an, another private practice, growing and learning about this world. And then eventually I uh, co-founded Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine with my, with my husband and recruited some of my close friends from residency. And uh, here we are. We're, just, we're growing today, really, multiple cities across the country as we speak. So it's pretty exciting stuff. I can appreciate that you started this center because of your own personal experience. And I'm sure the passion for this field uh, certainly comes across given that experience. So thank you for, for taking that experience and turning it into something good. Thanks. It's a, it's a great field, trying to re- recruit as many medical practitioners as we can. <laughs> so tell us, for those who don't know, let's start with the basics. What is pelvic floor rehabilitation? Rehabilitation in general is the concept of resetting and retraining uh, your muscles and nerves, essentially. Um, That's really what we do in rehab. Uh, And we're just taking this approach and applying it to the pelvis. So conceptually, we talk to patients about you're like an iPhone. We're turning you off and on and rebooting and resetting so that the wiring um, works better. So we're trying to really improve your muscle function and your nerve function. Um, so that is what conceptually rehab, rehab doctors do, whether they're t- treating post-stroke patients or, or spinal cord injury. It's all conceptually the same. The, the idea that there is something called neuroplasticity where your muscles and your nerves um, can heal and can get better. So that's really what we're doing with the, the pelvic world. Um, and es- essentially what we are doing is really being detectives when male or female patients come to us with pelvic floor muscle dysfunction or pelvic pain and just trying to figure out the primary pain generator um, because in the world of pelvic pain, there are kind of multiple organ systems down there. So we're trying to figure out the primary pain generator as well as treat the muscles, nerves, and joint dysfunction. So to bring this to life, how about if we walk through an example. So maybe generally you could first start with what sorts of conditions pelvic floor rehabilitation treats, and then maybe walk through a specific condition and either what you do or how it helps, just so we can add some color uh, to this. Sure, sure. So basically to understand what would come in to see us in the clinic, 
it's that whole sling. So at the front of this, this pelvic floor, it goes from your pubic symphysis in the front to your coccyx or tailbone in the back. So it's a big muscular sling, right? And it holds up in the front the bladder. And then in the middle, you have the male and female organs. And then in the back, you have the descending colon. So people would come into us, the common chief complaints would be urinary urgency is common or frequency, or patients come in frustrated, they're like, it feels like I have a UTI, but the workup's negative, or I had one and was treated, but now the culture's negative, but it still feels like I have a UTI that's super common in the world of pelvic floor. So that's one thing. And then also... Intercourse is a very common chief complaint. So a lot of pain during intercourse we see, either superficial burning or discomfort during the deep intercourse or positional, um, or it's, it's very common to have a soreness post-intercourse with our world. Um, as the muscles, muscles and nerves are firing, they can produce this kind of soreness. So that's very common. And then the back of the sling is the descending colon. So another common thing we see is constipation, um, which we describe as the enemy of the muscles and nerves of the pelvic floor. So we are always trying to stay ahead of constipation. Pain with bowel movement or straining on the toilet for, you know, for as long as they can remember, um, or even bowel frequency sometimes we can see um, in our patients. And um, sometimes we have a little bit of tailbone pain, hip issues, or abdominal discomfort or bloating too. But it's all about that kind of pelvic floor sling. So those, those are classically what what people will come to see us for. Those are the chief complaints that we hear and see all day. I had no idea that even with sexual intercourse challenges that pelvic floor rehabilitation could help. So where I really learned about this was at the recent endometriosis summit, where I know you were on the panel, and there was a lot of discussion around the pelvic floor and a healthy sex life. And I loved hearing that partners will even come in so that both couples can talk about what they can do to improve the experience and allowing them also to be more effective in their communication. I think a lot of us are naively taught what intercourse is and is not and not learning how to communicate your needs or the pain that you may have and then also what one can do about it. So I was really fascinated about that. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you work with these couples to better support their experience with each other. It's not uncommon where the partner will come in to be appointment with, with each other, which I think is the best. It makes, you know, to have that support, it's just amazing. Um, so I, I, those patients always seem to do a bit better, I think, because they just have such wonderful open communication and support. So yeah, I always say to people, it is really important to speak up, you know, when you ha- are having discomfort, but, you know, with, with your sexual partner, um, but it is, you know, important to let them know where there's discomfort. A lot of times, like I said, it is positional and we, we talk about certain positions such as that sometimes the female on top that may give her more control so that she can kind of control areas that, that hurt and don't. Um, we talk about options such as you know, lubrication, tools such as the O-nut during intercourse where you kind of have a nice barrier um, if you feel going too deep hurts too much. The overall uh, gist is to try and you know, make it so that there's open lines of communication while still really enjoying this important part of an intimate relationship. And then, you know, we quite often will bring in a, a sex therapist as well um, to, to work with our patients, which we find is extremely helpful. And quite often what we do, if we just are meeting a patient, we make a nice plan to, to get them um, having uh, intercourse in a way that feels good. And sometimes if, if it is excruciatingly painful, you know, we ask them, you know, at this point, maybe if penetration is painful, we don't, we don't have penetration until, you know, after it's like a two, two month or two to three month plan. And then we try it again, not because it's harmful, but because we really are trying to decrease any sort of negative association with intercourse overall. Uh, so, so we usually are open and honest and we, we really do make a stepwise plan. This is X, Y, Z. This is what we need to do to get you here. Um, so this is what we're going to do. And then maybe reintro- reintroduce penetration when we feel you're, when we feel you're ready. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for, for educating us about how you're able to help with uh, some of those aspects. Uh, another one I'd love to dig into is UTIs. Uh, again, 
pelvic floor rehabilitation is not something that's commonly discussed. Quite honestly, whenever I've talked to women about UTIs, it's okay, just make sure you drink a lot of cranberry juice and make sure you're urinating after intercourse. And that's about it. So talk to us about that, please. So essentially when I say it's sensation of UTI, um, so what I'm saying is it it's, can be frustrating because it feels like a UTI, but actually it's not. Because either you, your, your previous UTI was completely treated with, one, with antibiotics, or you never really had a UTI, and it's actually nerve issues. So conceptually what we're doing in terms of both UTI and intercourse is we're really treating the nerves that are firing inappropriately. Sometimes when the pelvic floor muscles are in spasm and they're, they're short, spastic, and weak, they irritate these nerves, particularly the pudendal nerve and its branches and the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. So they kind of squeeze them and irritate them, which causes inflammation, and then the nerves fire when they shouldn't. And they can cause pain with intercourse, sensation of UTI, um, our very common urgency, frequency, all those things. Um, so conceptually, our protocol, what we're doing is just reversing that process. We're decreasing inflammation, we're increasing blood flow, which ultimately will allow those nerves to heal themselves, really. We're just kind of creating a better environment so that they can chill out and not be so inflamed, and then they can function better. So that you won't have these symptoms that really are just the nerve firing when it shouldn't. So it's not a real UTI, and, and that can happen even with intercourse pain, right? So conceptually, we're trying to just create space, calm down the nerves so that you can have intercourse and, and it won't be uncomfortable. That's what we do. So how would someone know that they feel they have a UTI but don't or actually have one? Oh, you just have, you get a simple test. Yeah. UA and Coulter. So you, you, your gynecologist would do a test or city MD. Yeah. You go to your primary care or gynecologist or city MD and you would have to have a test. So quite often it is negative. <laughs> and then they're, that's when they're sent to us. At, at this point, it's usually uh, their public floor physical therapist or their uh, OBGYN who will send to us because they realize that it's not an infection. So if it's not an infection, you know, you, you're not going to be the antibiotics wouldn't help it. Okay. Um, so then they say, oh, it must be your nerve. So then they think of PRM to help calm down the nerve inflammation. Got it. Would you say that it's common for OBGYNs to know that pelvic floor rehabilitation is an option? Should someone have that feeling of a UTI, but not actually have the UTI? <laughs> That's a great question. Not so we're, we know we are a newer field of rehab medicine for sure. Um, and as I had mentioned, we are, we are growing. So I think the awareness is growing, but still not where it needs to be. So not necessarily some, you know, some OBGYNs are aware, but probably at this point we need to do, you know, a better job of letting them know that we are here. <laughs> so all those ladies out there who are listening to this podcast who don't want to go to your doctor and are just constantly drinking cranberry juice, go get a test to figure out if the cranberry juice is actually going to be helping you because it might be your pelvic floor. Thank you, Allison, for clarifying that. <laughs> exactly. I'm chuckling. Well, I, appreciate you. <laughs> I, I have a friend who you know, was having some of these issues. And I'm, I'm definitely going to be contacting her right after we get off of this podcast. So that I, <laughs> yeah. she had the test done. So, yeah. so thank you for the, the new news. So it is Endometriosis Awareness Month. And I do want to make sure we cover that because again, we met at the Endo Summit. And I think there's a lot of women out there with endometriosis, a lot of women who have it and don't know it. I'd love to have you share with the audience a bit more about how pelvic floor rehabilitation can help endometriosis specifically. And I think what would be helpful is kind of having an eye on, like I know we've already discussed the themes of pelvic floor rehabilitation, but again, just since there's so much pain involved with endo and a lot of women aren't even aware that they may have it or that something can be done, it would be so nice for you to add some color specific to endometriosis. Endometriosis, how can it affect your pelvic floor muscles and nerves? So it's kind of multifactorial. One, the presence of endometriosis quite often causes your pelvic floor muscles to go into what we call a chronic guarding state where they go into spasm. And that then will lead to that whole cycle, as we had mentioned earlier, of really kind of squeezing the nerves and increasing the nerve inflammation, right? So you have this spastic 
for with nerve inflammation or neurogenic inflammation, which then gives off symptoms of all the urinary intercourse, bowel, and sometimes some um, even lower abdominal pain. So that's one reason it causes the pelvic floor spasm. Number two, endometriosis in and of itself is a pro-inflammatory state, right? So it stimulates the release of what we call these pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha to, to, uh, are some of them, but really what it does is it stimulates that inflammatory soup around these nerves again, right? So these nerves are the culprit for, this inflammation around these nerves are the culprit for a lot of these symptoms. So that's a second reason. Um, a third reason for endometriosis causing pelvic pain is it can directly invade nerves as well. It's not as common, but it can do that. So it's direct invasion is, is the third option. But those would be the reasons that people would come to us with these symptoms that are caused by endometriosis itself. And lastly, when this happens, so that peripheral nerve inflammation, when that happens for a long period of time, greater than six months, those signals then go to the spinal cord and brain. And what happens is something called central sensitization or wind-up phenomenon, where really you get just this heightened sense of your nervous system overall from the central nervous system aspect. The reason why I say that is because when we treat people, we really address all of it. <laughs> so we, treat, we address the, nerve, the peripheral nerve uh, inflammation as well as the central sensitization and, and then also that myofascial tension. So it's like a three-prong approach to get people better. This may be a loaded question and it's not intended so, but just given that I've attended these conferences, I myself had experienced endo. I'm fortunate enough that I am asymptomatic, but it definitely affected my fertility. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the pain and surgery, because you know I hear these women where if some will have the laparoscopic surgery, they'll have it multiple times because as you know, endometriosis likely comes back. In some cases, it's been suggested that they do a hysterectomy. I'd love to better understand how the pelvic floor rehabilitation pain support could be looked at as unique or unique from, okay, I should have surgery. And I know that you're not a surgeon, so I'm not expecting you to like come from the expert of a surgeon, but I think just from a pelvic floor rehabilitation expert perspective and, and having seen so many of these patients, I think it would really help these women to better understand what is the role of the surgery or the, the hysterectomy and what is the role of pelvic floor rehabilitation when you look at the whole pain picture. No, that's an excellent question, honestly. So at this point, most of our patients um, who come present to us really present not knowing if, not with a diagnosis of endo. So really our, our approach is we, we treat them and if, we, if they respond, then, then they respond and, and they keep going. And if they don't respond or they're enough, then we, endo is high on the suspicion. So then we would try to refer to an a, a endo specialist in the, in the gynecological world. So really the way we fit in is, is really twofold. One is post a, a proper excision surgery, which it is important to have an excision surgery versus an, an, an ablation. After surgery, quite often uh, patients have persisting symptoms and that's okay. That doesn't, so we attribute that to the whole cycle we were discussing with the peripheral and central sensitization process and sometimes some pelvic floor uh, muscle spasm which can persist because it was there for so long, right? So just think of it, it's, it's been, you know, the endometriosis has been there for a bit of time causing these problems. And then you remove what we call the primary pain generator, which in this case is endo. Um, sometimes it doesn't just automatically go back. Um, it just needs treatment and that's okay. A lot of times once it's removed, then we go ahead and we treat the muscle spasm in the pelvic floor and we treat all the nerve inflammation and patients respond nicely because uh, the endometriosis is no longer there fighting it. So we usually will see patients post-op if you have any persisting symptoms, whatever it is. Everyone's symptoms are different. Um, but if you do have them, and then they come see us. And then pelvic floor physical therapy and physiatry usually treat patients together. So we, we, we work closely with pelvic floor physical therapists. And we treat patients to, to kind of get them feeling better after surgery if needed. So that's kind of one option. That's probably 
are most common is, is surgeons uh, will send to us if someone goes back on, on follow-up and has persistent pain, right? Or the pelvic floor physical therapist notes that they had the surgery, but they still have symptoms, then they would come get our treatment. Another option is we call it prehab. So Dr. Iris Orbach and I are really trying to get that concept out there. So for prehab, meaning it's kind of wrapping a patient's muscles and nerves up in a nice bow and presenting them for surgery conceptually, basically treating them before and hopes that they're really going to respond better to surgery and, and won't have, decrease any potential flares, decrease any requirements for pain medications, post-op, all those things. Um, so that's another way we some, some surgeons like to send to us before surgery, meaning just to kind of get you a bit better and less, we call hot, less hot, so that when you do have your surgery, you'll respond better. So those are kind of the two ways with endometriosis that we work closely with excision surgeons, as well as pelvic floor physical therapists. And we talk a lot about, again, um, nutrition and mindfulness meditation with our patients as well. So for sure, we take a very much a holistic approach to this. Tell me about the pelvic floor physical therapist versus your role. What, what's the difference between what's being, I guess, done to the patient, so to speak? So that's a great question. So the different roles are essentially when people see us and they haven't even tried pelvic floor physical therapy at all, we would send them for a two-month course of, of pelvic floor physical therapy. That's kind of the first place to start and see if that gets rid of or makes you feel better. Um, and then if it doesn't or if it's not or if you plateaued or you helped, you know, maybe it helped a little bit, like 30 to 40 percent, but you're still having symptoms, then we can do kind of do more. Um, so as physiatrists, we're, M- we're med- MDs or DOs, so we're, we're physicians. Um, so by, by do more, it just depends on the situation. Sometimes imaging is required. Sometimes suppositories of baclofen or Valium or topical creams are required. And in addition, um, we do a, a protocol, which is uh, external ultrasound-guided hydrodissection nerve blocks and trigger point injections. I, all external ultrasound guided. Um, we uh, patients go right to work, kind of like a dental appointment. I mean, you see us at eight thirty in the morning, and you're at your ten o'clock uh, work meeting. Um, so you do go on with your day, and it's, so it's an RMB approved through the Feinstein Medical Institute. So we published two papers on it thus far, but we're continuously publishing and gathering more kind of patient reported outcomes um, on what we're doing. But yeah, so essentially we're. We use lidocaine, external ultrasound-guided trigger points and nerve blocks with lidocaine and, and a bit of steroid once or twice. And then we transition to lidocaine and uh, something called Tremiel, which is a homeopathic, mostly Arnica um, medication to really help treat all that inflammation and promote healing. Arnica is the best. <laughs> yes. I love it. <laughs> That's <It's> magic. <laughs> it is magic. I know. I first discovered it as a surgery intern in our plastic surgery rotation, we would give it to everybody because, you know, to prevent all the bruising and to promote, promote faster healing topically. So basically it's just injectable. We just put injectable Arnica um, around the, the, the nerves to help them heal. That's wonderful. Now, I don't want to lose the point that you made earlier about excision being more ideal than ablation. This was also brought up at the Endo Summit in February, early February, and, or sorry, early March. And I'd love to get your perspective on, on what, you know, again, I know you're not the surgeon, but you do see a lot of these patients. And I'd be curious to get your perspective just so that our listeners can understand the difference and, and why it's important to perhaps consider the excision instead. Yeah. So with the excision, essentially what you're doing is you're, you're just removing at a deeper level, right? So layers that are deeper, which does um, promote less recurrence. Whereas with an ablation, you're, you're essentially burning off, but it's really more the top layers. So there may be with an ablation, some residual cells that are left behind, which then can, re- then can grow and recur. So conceptually, it's basically just removing the endometriosis at a deeper level. And um, our, our surgeon at PRM is Dr. Lori Liu, um, and she essentially has had, you know, she's an extra fellow, fellowship at Mayo Clinic. So another two years beyond a standard residency to really go learn the, the special technique to treat endometriosis via excision surgery. And um, she, you, you know, robotic surgery or non-robotic, you can do it either. Um, but conceptually, you are excising. 
Okay, got it. Thank you for clearing that up. Because I know when you stated that, just in case people didn't know the difference or know that there was a difference or why one was better than the other, I thought it would be helpful to do that. So I do have one more question about endometriosis, but those who are listening, um, I do want to acknowledge that I posted on social media to uh, share your questions with us so that we can um, leverage Dr. Shrikande's knowledge to be able to help answer your questions. So we will get to those before we end this podcast. But I did want to close out the topic of endometriosis with another question. Recently, there was an article posted just a couple days ago, actually, about Botox helping with endometriosis-related pain. So yes, it's, it would not be treating the underlying primary pain generator, right? So uh, unless you're saying the only way is if you had the excision surgery and then had Botox right after, in that it's really treating not endo, right? It's not treating endometriosis, it's treating the muscle and nerves, yeah, which could be in spasm secondary to endo. But Botox itself is not treating endometriosis at all. So, uh, um, you know, I get this question a lot. So conceptually, uh, what our protocol is more functional, more restorative approach to really rewire, reset, retrain muscles and nerves back to their baseline. So more of kind of a healing approach um, than Botox. Um, The main issue with Botox is it can cause weakness in the pelvic floor, which Again, as rehab doctors, we don't love that because we're trying to reset that muscle spindle and ultimately make it stronger. <laughs> so that, that can be the problem is it can cause weakness if you, if you use too much. And also it's, it's the risks of Botox, bowel, bladder incontinence, urinary retention. All those really go up uh, as well as the weakness with, dose, with the dose required. So essentially um, for Botox, um, I'm a fan of less is more. <laughs> So conceptually, the only time at PRM that we would use it is we use it post our protocol. So say someone comes after a proper endo excision, which is always, you know, we want the first step, but then you still have these persisting symptoms. We would treat your muscles and nerves, treat the inflammation, reset, retrain. And then if we got you say, you know, 70% better, but then the residual 30 that, you know, sometimes you can do a little Botox then, but you just, the key concept is you, is to keep the dose low, you know, because that, that doesn't cause as much weakness and or risk. So overall, um, that would be how we would use it. We don't, we don't do it very, very often as our approach is a bit more functional restorative. And also for sure, if you have endometriosis, it is not treating endo there. That's definitely not what it's doing. It's addressing the okay. pelvic floor muscles and nerves. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. All right. So on to a few questions. I have four questions, unless someone sends me a message as we're talking. Four questions for you from our listeners. One is to tell us about Yachty eggs and how to start out with them. So I guess this would be a tell us what the benefit is, what they do, and and what do you even do to begin? So Yachty eggs, you we we use for patients again um, at the six week follow up. If you know you've gotten a lot better. You know, we don't suggest when you're, you know, in any discomfort to use them. Um, but they, what they're great is they help really find your pelvic floor. They really help with that mind-body connection. Um, I know they're from um, the ancient Asia and the Sanskrit um, with really a sacred meaning behind it. So I do think it helps women kind of sense their pelvic floor, start to feel kind of comfortable and um, excited about intercourse. And conceptually, patients usually use them for, you want to start off about, you know, 15 minutes at a time, um, but you can increase the, the, the duration that you do leave them in. Uh, and that's it. I usually ask patients to discuss it with, uh, with their pelvic floor physical therapist as well to see if they feel that they're ready um, and to definitely start with a size that, that feels comfortable. So would you recommend that this is not something we go on Amazon and buy Yanni eggs and start using them? It sounds like we partner with a doctor or or could there be instances where it's okay to just use them? I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Gwyneth Paltrow on Goop is is talking a lot about Yanni eggs and getting a lot of flack for it. So I'd love some clarity around, you know, precautions to take so that um, people you know, truly understand it before they make decisions to purchase these. Right. Well, th- this is not something that there's any medical data on. So there's okay. no real studies. So that's always, you know, for, as a physician, there is just, just no data on it. You know, in terms of um, safety, 
I would definitely not, if you are someone who has pelvic floor muscle dysfunction in general, I would seek uh, either a pelvic floor PT or a physician out before, you know, trying them. And overall, if you don't, I would definitely try one that's smaller and see how it feels. And if there's any sort of discomfort, then I would not use it. You know, that, that again, it's, there's, this is not a medical, there's, there's no studies on this. So this is definitely not something that we necessarily prescribe. We don't prescribe it. Um, but, you know, if patients of ours have mentioned that they're doing it, it's, it's not contraindicated. It's okay to try if, you know, I would start small and start okay. for not a long time. And, and you have found that there's been benefit with it? Based on no, what- I, I don't have too much experience in terms of benefit. Okay. No, honestly. So I can't say that now. It okay. would be, I haven't had enough experience to say that. And hopefully there's detailed instructions whenever someone purchases the Yanni eggs. Um, so thank you for your perspective. Now, another question that came up is um, we have one person who is one year post baby and I'm assuming uh, the sexual function is probably a little bit different once you've, you've had a child. So she was asking about any specific pelvic floor um, exercises that may be helpful. Yeah, so that's a bit of a challenge to answer without an, talking to and examining because it really just depends on how your pelvic floor reacted to the delivery. So if it's hypotonic or hypertonic, the exercises would be kind of a bit different. I think that's a bit, I would, that's a bit challenging to answer. <laughs> Because I, I, it just there's two different categories, so you know, and, and it would depend um, on how on how they were. So, so you can't so, give eagles to a hypertonic postpartum. So it really oh, you need, you need it. yeah, that would make you worse. So that's why a lot of my patients come and they're like, I tried my eagles and it's getting worse. I'm like, I know it will. So um, it just depends on if you're hypo or hyper. So you would need an exam. Okay. I think that that is a great comment because I will say that, and this is such a shame that we women just don't know enough about our bodies. Cause literally I, I thought you were going to tell me here are the three Kegel exercises you do. And um, you know, here I'm now learning even myself that there's other exercises and it's not all Kegels. And as you said, they may actually hurt. So to the person who asked this question, I think it's time for you to go see a pelvic floor rehabilitation specialist and see what's causing it to then figure out the exercises. And if you are doing Kegels, maybe that's the problem. So thank you for, for clarifying that. Yeah, no problem. The next one is around a prolapsed rectum. What was shared is this person has a prolapsed rectum and had the baby 22 years ago. And the doctor says not to worry about it but she feels it's like a big bulge when she goes to the bathroom. Yeah, no, I would see, seek medical care if you are concerned. And particularly if there's, you're sensation, sensing a heavy bulge with um, having a bowel movement, I would seek, you could see a local, if there is a pelvic floor rehab physician or your gynecologist. You could ask your gynecologist for a referral to pelvic floor physical therapy. I think that's an excellent place to start. Okay. So maybe she's in a situation where it's simply an OB who may not know more. So this would be something to try. So here's a question for you, though. And this, this really hit home last year at the Endometriosis Foundation of America's conference, where they were talking about how with endometriosis, as an example, the optimal situation is to have a team of surgeons on standby because you never know where the endometriosis is. And someone from, I think, Mississippi stood up and said, why don't you tell me how I'm going to find a team of surgeons in Mississippi? If I'm in New York, that's fine, but not in Mississippi. And I just really started to have so much compassion for women who live in more rural areas where the specialists aren't as readily available as in a big city like New York. So what would you recommend if this person or anyone listening is in a situation where there's not so close? Are there like other options or are they just going to have to make the drive? I don't know if you've run across this and and have some wisdom to share. Oh, yes, I know. That is a huge challenge. Uh, I would, so the International Pelvic Pain Society has a, is excellent resource about find, it's a find a provider link. So I would definitely check there because it will tell you if there's, you know, the closest providers. So who understand pelvic floor and pelvic pain. So that's one option. I would definitely find or Google your nearest pelvic floor physical therapist. And sometimes you know, at this point, there is a bit of a drive. So I, 
that would be, you know, the best, the best advice I could give is to find the local public floor physical therapist. And, you know, there, there are more and more coming even into, you know, the more rural areas. We do have a, a Facebook group, Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine uh, has a Facebook group, which is, I think, excellent for a lot of our patients who are either international or in more remote areas with a lot of information from experts. So we have information on it from experts from pelvic floor physical therapists to, you know, yoga experts in the pelvic floor. So those are all that you can check out the, the Facebook group as well. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate your perspective on that because it is a challenge and I, I wish both you and I could wave our magic wand and, and change the situation. And unfortunately, that's not the case, but I appreciate you offering suggestions for the scenario some of these women may be facing. So the last question, and I know this is a broad one, so maybe uh, we could speak about themes. The last one is, how does pelvic floor rehabilitation help with fertility? I, you know, that has, there's no data on that. So I, I, I don't, you know, when we see patients, we say we can help, you know, have more comfortable intercourse, we can help your bladder, your bowels, but we don't really claim to help with fertility. It may potentially help in terms of conceptually our, the PRM protocol is decreasing inflammation, right? So that's our whole thing is treating that neurogenic inflammation, which overall I can't imagine would not help, <laughs> help create a better environment having less inflammation around your, your fascia and your nerves. Um, so, but however, we, we don't really directly claim that. Uh, one thing we do help with fertility is we help you have intercourse. <laughs> so that is key for having for fertility. So those would be the two reasons, really helping you have uh, comfortable intercourse and enjoyable intercourse and helping just decrease overall inflammation in the pelvis, which most likely can only help with fertility. But right. again, there's no data on it. We haven't gotten there yet. Maybe right. someday. <laughs> that makes sense. And I, and I think that's a, a valuable bit of information because, as you know, when you're struggling with infertility, it's already hard enough dealing with intercourse because everything is on a schedule and it really does impact the relationship. So if, if the intercourse is painful at the very least, you know, try something like pelvic floor rehabilitation just to at least make the experience better knowing what someone is facing with all the uncertainty. So. That's yeah, and and in course, and also we we treat a lot of our patients. They'll come for treatment before they're getting any um, fertility procedure, right? Because sometimes those aren't comfortable either. So sometimes we'll treat just for that, for any sort Ooh. of egg harvesting or IVF treatments. They'll say, "Oh, I'm having it in you know four weeks or three weeks." So we'll treat them before or even six weeks, whatever it is. So that's common. We see that a lot. How does it help? I'm very curious. We're just making, we're, we're just trying to make the procedures more comfortable, right? Okay. So we're, we're, we're decreasing the inflammation around their nerves and spasm of the muscles. So ultimately that will help make the procedure more comfortable. Got it. Uh, too bad I'm, I'm uh, uh, almost 46. So I think fertility treatments are out the window for me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> unless, unless I have a miracle egg sitting know. in there somewhere. <laughs> Never know. Never know. So I, I really appreciate everything you've shared, Dr. Srikande. And, you know, I met you last year at the Endometriosis Foundation of America conference, and I'm so glad I ran into you again today and that you're, you were so open to sharing your expertise with the women who so desperately need this information and it's not as readily available. I would love to end on, given, you know, you started out by having your own personal experience and now building this great organization that is expanding across the U.S. and is clearly needed what would you say is your greatest hope for women's health? Uh, my greatest hope is that women continue to recognize the importance of their voice and really continue to, to kind of speak up, push for more research, more awareness, um, and also um, that the fact that any of these symptoms are just not normal. Don't settle for it's, it's just my body and it's normal and don't, don't let yourself be ignored. Wow. What a perfect way to end. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. And again, what you're doing for women's health. As I've noticed in this 10 year journey, the only way change is going to happen is if we all work together. And I appreciate what your contribution is to women. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Georgie. Thanks so much for having me.